My guest today on Top Job shows that having a strong mathematical background can set you apart in life, not just in the normal careers of finance, accounting and that sort of thing, but also in climate change. Martin Van Alst is the director of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Climate Center, and he's also a senior advisor on many intergovernmental agencies around the world on the issue of climate change. Today I sit with Martin to find out exactly how the climate should affect us, why we should care about climate change, and also his work at the Red Cross and the Red Crescent in making sure that we understand the importance of the different areas of climate change. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of Top Job with me, Mwanesi Musalia. And you know when you look outside and you, you're not quite sure what to put on, is it hot, is it cold, um, could this be the season that you know, the, the rainy season is going to you know, take a break? Well, if there's someone who understands something about climate change, it is my guest today on Top Job, Martin Van Alst. He is the director of the Climate Center at the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and we're so pleased that he's managed to take time out of his busy schedule to join us on Top Job. Welcome, Martin. Pleasure. Good to have you around. Um, Martin, um, I know you're, you're, you're a very busy man and um, you know, when you're looking at something as huge as climate change, that must be a very intense job. Tell me a little bit about uh, your day, your typical work day uh, at the Red Cross and Red Crescent. So my team works with uh, the Red Cross and Red Crescent globally. So a bit of that is uh, with the International Federation in Geneva and uh, they're relating to the big international policy processes. So we're negotiating right now with all the countries about how to deal with climate change. You know, should we make uh, agreements among all countries to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are causing this problem? But also, how do we support countries to deal with the, the risks that are already changing, you know, like the changing rainfall here in Kenya? Right. Or, and um, so we, we help the International Red Cross in, in those international discussions. So that's the one side, uh, more like international diplomacy. The other side is much more practical on the ground, where you know our Red Cross Red Crescent volunteers are at the front lines of these rising risks. You know, uh, whenever there's a disaster, they are the ones to to respond, and uh, those disasters are changing. So we're seeing floods in places where we haven't seen them before. Uh, we're seeing different storm tracks. Uh, we're seeing changes in in rainy seasons, like you may have experienced in Kenya as well. We're seeing heat waves also in my own home country in the Netherlands, which is, thinks of itself as a fairly cold country. Right. Uh, where we, we had disasters with over a thousand people killed by a heat wave. So I want to stop there because I, I'll, I'll take you back to your, your upbringing and, and, and how you ended up in this job. But I have a very specific question to our own country, Kenya. Uh, we've recently banned uh, plastic bags. Um, I don't know how much of that um, uh, goes to affecting uh, climate change, if any, and, and if you have any comments on, on the, the ban on plastic bags. Well, it's an example of how you can make really concrete progress, you know. Uh, I think it's a very effective measure uh, to, to clean up the local environment. Uh, the plastic doesn't have a very direct impact on the global warming, so that is caused by greenhouse gases, so for instance, uh, you know, the fuel that you use to, to run a car. Right. Um, but also... But to the environment, obviously, and, there's... But to the local environment, it has a big impact. And for instance, what we see in many places is that the plastic bags uh, clog the drainage channels. So if you have a flood problem, uh, the plastic bags locally make the risk of that flood much worse. Uh, this is the case with many aspects of, of climate change. So what you see is the weather is changing, right? There's, a, there's, for instance, more extreme rainfall, so a higher risk of flooding. Now, that climate is changing, and we need to reduce the emissions, and, and globally over time, we really need to do that, because otherwise the problem will get out of hand. But the climate has already changed as well, so th that extreme rainfall is happening. And most of the solutions to that flood, flood risk, then, for instance, are, are really local. And it's things like making sure you don't have the plastic bags clogging the drainage channel. Got you. You, see, you sound very passionate about this. Is this something that you wanted to do um, when you were a child growing up? Did you look up and say, you know what, I actually want to go into studying climate and the environment and that sort of thing? Tell me a little bit about your, your, your background in childhood. As a child, I was interested in, in uh, global issues and also interested... Really? In, yeah, yeah. At what age was that? 
Uh, I think already in elementary school. Okay. But uh, in high school, I participated in these these mock international organization competitions, for instance, where you would sort of play the diplomat and play a role of a particular country. So did you country. have like a, um, a globe of the world? You know, we had these these globes in in our in as a child. You have this globe in your room. Did you did you have something like that? Yeah, and I look at these different countries. I Fantastic. Mean, my my parents took me to different countries, mostly in Europe, but I was oh, always wow. fascinated by countries around the world. So that element as well, fascinated by different cultures. Um, at the time I was growing up, actually the big environmental problem in Europe was acid rain. So because of, you know, actually similar emissions like from, from cars, but also from agriculture, right. um, we, we had rain that, that contained sulfuric acid. Does it actually burn? Like if, if You don't feel it, but okay. on average, it, it, so there were dramatic images in the news, for instance, of forests dying because the plants couldn't cope. Oh, wow. And, um, Did that have an impact on you? Or? As a child, that was a big thing, you know? Okay. And, also that notion that um, we are responsible with what we do for what's happening at a much bigger scale to the environment we live in and depend on. Right. So that, that fascinated me. Um, but in the end, I, I just, you know, life takes its course. And um, I, I was interested actually also in, in, in uh, the understanding of those linkages. You know, how does our day-to-day -day behavior through these, these global systems then come to affect us in right. some way? So uh, I was interested in these scientific linkages. So I ended up going into science and then ended up in college more or less by accident, just in, uh, in the field where the most interesting science was to be done at that point, and that was astrophysics. Wow. Uh, so quite remote from day-to-day -day environmental problems here. And astrophysics is, just describe it in a nutshell. So it's studying basically the universe and the stars, uh, understanding what's happening. Uh, in my case, in the end, I ended up studying the sun and the sun's atmosphere. Did you work for NASA? And yes, ended up at NASA wow. working with a satellite that was actually between the Earth and the Sun, so like a million, million and a half kilometers from here, uh, and, and using the, the, the NASA Deep Space Network to even communicate with it. It would take a time for our our communication to the satellite to come there and then come back. So all these fascinating, uh, you know, like the, the the kids' dreams about astronauts and. Exactly, uh, and, and you know what, and I, I want to I just, because we have a different understanding of the term NASA here, so can you just tell us exactly what NASA stands for? So NASA is, is the space agency of the United States, essentially. Uh, so they, they, uh, they launched the space shuttles, for instance. So when I was there, the, the Goddard Space Flight Center, where I was, was the backup station for the communication with the space shuttle, where they had astronauts in space doing their experiments there. Uh, but they also have uh, a huge program uh, with unmanned satellites. So they launch these satellites that, that, that are sometimes in, in Earth orbit, so they're around the Earth, but also the satellites that go much further away. Sometimes, like, like the Mars rovers, they actually even put little uh, machines on planets to, or further planets to, to study them. That's incredible. So I'm, I'm, if, I'm a, if, I'm a, if I'm someone watching this show right now and I'm thinking, I... I, I have an interest in science. I'm curious about the universe and how the universe works. How would I get a, get around to getting a job at NASA? Well, so it's, it's a long path, and, and you have to. Um, it's, so first of all, it is competitive. So okay. you have to, you know, you have to be good at, at what you do. Uh, in my case, I just came out of a physics degree, so um, you know you need to. Oh, your degree was in physics. Yeah, well, it was astrophysics, okay. but it was so the, the specialization into astronomy and and, uh, and astrophysics is a sort of branch out of, of physics, actually. At so university. At level. university. Wow. Yeah. So that means in, in high school you need to be you know good at math, for instance. Right. You know, there's there's a lot of you know hard work just doing doing the calculations and understanding the systems. Um, what was really lovely about astrophysics is also that you needed to be able to dream and, and you know, come up with radical theories about things that, because a lot of what's out there in space, we don't yet know of. So you need to know what to focus your calculations on. A lot right. of it is, is hard work and hard math, but it also requires that creativity, and that's what pulled me to it. And I think in the end, the people that succeed, uh, for instance, getting a job at NASA, are the people that have that combination of right. you know, being good at at what you do in this case, also just the hard math and so, but also that passion and that curiosity. And would you say that once you arrived at NASA, was that, was that your peak? Is that something that you would have considered a dream job or um, were you always seeking something else uh, after that? Well, it was fascinating and I really enjoyed it, but um, I also felt that uh, it may, maybe also coming back to that, that childhood feeling, uh, it was very remote from our day-to-day -day challenges in the world. And, and I know, you know, 
I was living at that, at that time in Washington, D.C., uh, at, at this NASA Carter Space Flight Center, life is easy. But I knew that that wasn't the case everywhere on Earth. So I, I was wondering how me studying the sun was going to make a difference to what we were facing uh, more down here. Right. So then I made a deliberate choice to, to change my, basically the application of the same skills from the solar atmosphere, so this, this, the, the, the atmosphere of the sun, which mm -hmm. has an atmosphere as well, you don't see it much, but, but there is an, a thin atmosphere around it. That's what, that's what I was studying at NASA. To the Earth atmosphere, where we have all these big questions coming our way about how is the climate changing, uh, are we responsible for those changes, but also what it's... What it's Very controversial science. topics, I can imagine. Certainly around that time. By now... What year was this, around about? This was around 1999. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, around that time, we were really still asking these questions like, how, sh how certain are we that humans are influencing the global climate? By now, the question is no longer, are humans influencing it, but what exactly is changing and how can we understand those changes? to better deal with the, the risks in, in society. And then you come to very practical things like uh, the plastic bags that we were talking about before. So from that, uh, so I, I still did a PhD in, uh, in atmospheric physics and chemistry, but I actually got much more interested in these questions of the applications. And I saw that the biggest difference could be made in the most vulnerable places. So looking at how the environment affects um, the dollar uh, spend decision making, um, in, in different parts of the world. And does that actually, is that actually a reality? Because m many of us are dealing with our day-to-day -day issues. I need, I need money so that I can buy, you know, the basics, food, shelter, clothing, transport, communication, entertainment. Where does the thought of the climate could be changing and it could affect me, how does that come into um, my normal as a layperson? Where does that come into my thinking and my psyche? Well, that's, I think, one of the communication challenges we have with climate change, you know? Right. It's not one thing that hits you as, you know, a, a problem on its own. Yeah, it because at government level, it's like, you know, that's a serious issue. But down here, where everybody else is living and working and breathing, um, it's not really a priority, or is it? I think it is if you ask sort of how it translates into day-to-day -day things. Perfect. So um, I want us to take a break there um, as we come back and speak about some of the more practical solutions and uh, look at your life uh, in working with the Red Cross and some of the things that you're currently doing now. As we take a break on Top Job. Welcome back to Top Job with me, Wanessa Musalia. This is the second part of the interview with Martin van Alst, director of the Climate Center at the Red Cross and Red Crescent. And um, give me a, a snapshot of your typical week working uh, with the Red Cross in your role. Yeah, so my, my week would often in involve at least one trip uh, to some, you know, meeting or, or a place where we do a training or provide technical support. Globally or? Um, well, my, my team, actually very deliberately to reduce the emissions from travel. I, I'm aware I'm on the plane a lot. Yes. Um, we actually plant trees to compensate for, for, for those trips, but still we're, we try to reduce those as, as much as we can as well. So we have deliberately chosen not to have 40 people in one office and have them fly around the world all the time, but have people distributed around the world. So my trips would then also be m more in the areas uh, close to me. But as director of the whole team, I also you know, visit the So right now I'm, I'm in Nairobi for an important meeting here. Um, so my average week would have a trip like that. It might involve uh, a, a conference or a, a policy meeting where mm -hmm. I represent the, the Red Cross concerns on the changing risks in, you know, for instance, these global climate negotiations in mm -hmm. the United Nations. Um, it might also be uh, working with the scientific community. So one other role we have is to try and get scientists to answer the questions that are really important to us. So to give you one example, when, when we started in the Red Cross working on climate change, a lot of the research was about answering that question, are humans to blame for climate change and how bad would climate change get? In order to answer that question, they were looking at questions like, how much is the global average temperature going to change by 2100? Well, well speaking yeah. of something really far away from day-to-day -day reality, it would be something like that, completely irrelevant to day-to-day -to -day life, also quite irrelevant to the Red Cross. As a scientist, I understand that if the global temperature warms, it's like, you know, if, if you have a, a pot on the fire and it starts cooking, it starts right. bubbling, and there's all kinds of other things happening other than just the temperature rising. But 
global temperature rise otherwise is a completely abstract thing. But in, in Red Cross Arcescent, we, we have 17 million volunteers all around the world. So wow. in the end, I consider them, I mean, I, I'm part of their team <laughs> rather than they're, they're part of my team. Right. But I, I very much see that whole network as, uh, as the network that we work with. You speak very, um, obviously passionately, but, uh, but also there's a, there's a sense that things are working and things are moving. Have you ever had any moments where you, you, you doubt um, the work that you're doing or you doubt yourself? I don't doubt the work that the Red Cross is doing and I don't doubt our contribution to it. Uh, at the same time, the work is, is also incredibly frustrating because it's never enough. There is a lot of suffering and uh, I, I ask myself all the time, are we doing enough? Um, it's in the nature of the Red Cross to just be there when a response for an emergency is needed. Uh, there's a lot more focus on preventing the disaster, so building the capacity to anticipate, so early warning systems, for instance, then being able to get people out of harm's way or to put measures in place to mm -hmm. prevent, say, extreme rainfall from resulting in flooding and flooding from damaging people. Um, so all of that is, is really valuable, but we'll be there when those risks are needed, uh, are, are taking place. Um, we still see a lot of people suffering, so we would like to, to be able to do more, and that is already challenging. Uh, I see a second problem coming our way, namely that we're currently not on track to reduce those emissions, and the problems might get much worse in the second half of the century. So there again, I'm wondering, are we doing enough to make people aware that the emissions that we're doing now are going to have this huge impact on our humanitarian work in 10, 20 years' time. It sounds like you're carrying a lot on your shoulders. Is there space to be a, a family man in all of this? Yeah, and I think you need to have that balance in life, first of all. So my family also keeps me grounded. Uh, I, I, I think my work is really valuable and important, but I, you know, I, I, I cannot take the weight of the whole world on my shoulders. I should also remain quite humble. I mean, what I said before, it's not that I can direct the whole Red Cross Rakesson network. It's more about um, speaking the right language, many right languages ar around the world, and, and, uh, and getting people excited. Sure. You do that better if you're also grounded yourself in a local reality and a local family in a way. And you, so you've, you've my got, kids actually yeah. help me do my, my work better. I was going to so ask, yeah, do you, do your kids understand the work that you do and do they have an interest in it? Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, once in a while, they uh, don't question my flying, also because they don't like me going away. <laughs> um, but they, um, yeah, they, I mean, they, they talk about it. In school, for instance, there was a, a strike of uh, high school students in the Netherlands. Recently. Oh, really? So, so my kids the, went to the, the Hague to the, protest. The, the students went on strike? Yeah, yeah. They, so they skipped school for a day to, uh, to go to the Hague and tell politicians that they felt uh, this was going to be their generation's burden to bear more even than the current generation. But the current generation is in power. So they were telling the current generation, you guys need to step up. That's incredible. W was that a proud moment for you? It was very nice to see. Well, it was especially nice. Uh, so this was mostly a high school thing, but my 11-year-old daughter, who's still in primary school, uh, decided to also go uh, oh, wow. with, with a, a friend. So as an 11-year-old going on her own to The Hague, that was special. Yeah. Wow. And, and you've got how many kids now? Three. Three yeah, kids. Yeah. So the 11-year-old is the youngest. And do you find that you have, besides being able to spend time with them, um, how, how are some of the ways that you decompress and uh, let go of some of the huge pressure and burden that you're currently carrying as the director of the Climate Center? Well, I guess the way everyone spent, I mean, I enjoy accompanying you go to, my kids you go to, to concerts, sports, sports matches, and okay. uh, yeah, uh, but I also enjoy a good book in the weekend and, and talking about that, uh, enjoying, we've, we've got a dog, so, you know, a nice walk in the forest. Uh, now, for someone who works globally, I, would, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't imagine that you would have one favorite destination that you would like to, to travel to. Well, of course, I would have to say it's Kenya. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> I actually, to be honest with, with the family, I, I often uh, also appreciate the really nearby holidays. You okay. know, my, my own country is beautiful, but in Europe, there are so many things. Uh, there's a tendency to think that you always need to go very far away to see something exciting, but there's also beauty very nearby everywhere. And uh, I... You know, th th there, there are really harsh environments where mm -hmm. I come with my work with the Red Cross and, and they're challenging, but there's also beauty almost anywhere. So what are some of the, now that you mentioned it, what are some of the harshest environments that you've been in from the extremely hot to the extremely cold? Have you, have you managed to travel to, let's say, uh, the Arctic or uh, like really, really intense uh, desert areas? I haven't been like to the far Arctic, but I've, I've, I've been far north, uh, so to those permafrost areas okay. where 
Um, the interesting thing is that the edge of the, so the, you know what permafrost is? It's, it's those areas that are frozen permanently. So it's, right. it's, the, 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 the temperature in the ground is always below zero. So there's basically ice in the ground all the time. One of the things is that the, the edge of the permafrost is shifting north because it's warming. Uh, so it's a, that's a problem for communities there because they have sometimes built their houses assuming that the, the ground was always going to be sturdy because it's frozen. Uh, and when it's no longer frozen, the house is destabilized. So that's, that's actually an area where you see changing risks as well. Um, that the, the true deserts, you know, they're getting slightly hotter, but they were hot and dry to begin with. Right. Uh, but the edges are, are really interesting, and cities there are, are opposing troubles. Um, I was speaking to, to colleagues in the ICRC, which is the, the side of the Red Cross that deals with conflict. Conflict, yes. And they were telling me about um, areas in the Middle East where, you know, there had been intense fighting, and the fighting had just subsided, and they were trying to rebuild the systems in, in those cities where people were, were gradually moving back in. Um, and they were looking at, you know, rebuilding hospitals, rebuilding water supply systems. And they have specifications for the equipment that they put in place to get those systems working again. And then suddenly they had an unprecedented heat wave up to 40, 54 degrees. 54 degrees 54 Celsius. 54 degrees Celsius. Um, so some of the specifications didn't, didn't work anymore, even though it's a hot area normally already. So you see those peak extremes in those really hot areas um, suddenly coming up. My own experience also, I've worked a lot, when I was working with the World Bank, I was working on the, the small island states, uh, especially in the, in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so you have these atoll countries that are spread out. There's a country called Kiribati, have you heard of that? No. It's a tiny country, uh, although it's a, as big as the continental United States. Wow. Uh, but the, the surface area is probably as, about as big as Nairobi. So it's spread out over thousands of kilometers of ocean, and then it's these tiny strips of atolls. Um, the highest point is not more than three meters above sea level. Um, so they're really worried about sea level rise. They're worried about longer periods of drought. And in those really isolated places, uh, the threat of climate change also really gets to you. It's amazing how resilient humanity is that we can, f we can literally exist in the Arctic, in the middle of the ocean somewhere, um, on, the, on the fringes of a desert where you know, degrees are pushing 54. It really speaks to uh, how resilient humanity is. On a final note, Martin, um, if, if there was one thing that um, someone who was watching would, would need to possess to be able to fill your shoes, what would it be? I think in the end it comes down to uh, an interest in humanity. You know? it's, it's what, what drives me really is, is people and on the one hand caring for people's well-being, but, but also those personal connections. Um, and that again, that's, it's a real privilege to be working in the Red Cross because we've got so many of those passionate people in our network. Fantastic. And it's, it's such a great pleasure to, to be able to meet with you and work with you. And, you know, congratulations on the great work that you're doing. And uh, hopefully we'll get to, to speak to you very, very soon. Thank you so very much, Martin. Pleasure. I really enjoyed talking to you. And Thank hopefully you. Um, we'll try not to burn too much diesel and uh, cause <laughs> changes in the, in the climate. Thank Appreciate you so much, Martin. It. Thanks. Take care. So the next time you're starting up your diesel engine, take time to think about the effect that that's having on the climate. Thank you so much for watching Top Job with me, Munesi Musalia. And remember, it's all about power moves only.